What I love about humor <laughs> is that it points out the crazy in everyday life. <laughs> How many of you guys have seen one of those commercials and been like, who would do that? Who would buy their spouse a car without talking to them? They must have a lot of money if they can just throw that kind of money around. You know, we hear ridiculous messages like that all the time, but sometimes we don't really question them, right? We get used to them. And, uh, you know, hopefully none of you have bought into a commercial so much that you've bought your spouse a car without talking to them. If you have, it's you learned, right? You know, <laughs> you figured that out. <laughs> but even if we chuckle at some of the ideas of some of the ways that things are sold to us, we may not realize the impact that these messages have on us, okay? Because we hear false messages about money all the time, right? All the time. <laughs> We're told that we deserve to be happy, and that it is this vacation or this product that will make us happy, right? And we're told, why wait when you can have it now? 90 days, same as cash. <laughs> now listen, you don't have the money now, but something's going to magically change in 90 days. <laughs> you know, I mean, who knows? You know, I hope so. I can get it now, so that's what matters. We're told that if we, we wear these clothes or we use this body soap or deodorant, that we are suddenly going to be the most popular people around. All you need is a different brand of makeup, ladies, and everything's <laughs> going to change for you. <clears throat> you know, even if we know, <laughs> yeah, some of you guys are like, that's right. You know, listen, even if we know that these things really aren't true, um, the more that you hear them, the less ridiculous they sound. <clears throat> and it's kind of a thing where you hear something over and over again, and suddenly the thing that sounded ridiculous at first, you're like, oh yeah, they just, they're just that way, you know, and, and you just start to accept it, right? And uh, things that sound crazy now sound normal. And if we've heard these kinds of things from the time that we're young, we may have never even really questioned them, right? And uh, last week, we started a series called Money Madness, right? And uh, we're going to look at some crazy things that we might believe about money uh, because Scripture has a lot to say about money, right? It has a lot to say about what we should believe about money and how we should act with money. And scripture also is kind of different in the way that it approaches money. There's some things that are common sense, and then there's some things that you're like, wow, that's way different than what I expected it would be. So last week, we talked about how money is linked to our survival and to our identity. If you were here last week, you remember that. Money is linked to our survival because we all need money to eat, right? We need, to, we need stuff so that we can survive. We need food, we need clothes, we need a place over our head. And money is linked to our identity because money is the passport to a lot of things that identify us. Perhaps our job is a big part of our identity, right? And that's kind of tied in with the way we make money, right? Uh, you know, the, the kind of house that we live in is part of our identity. It's part of the way that people identify us. Oh, they live on this part side of town or this part. Of, I know every side of Fernley is awesome, okay? But, you know, it's like there are some places where there's different sides of towns, you know? And so like, oh, they live over here, so they're this kind of person. They live over here, so they're this kind of person. Surely you guys have never heard that or thought that or experienced that. But it's a thing. Money's linked to our survival and our identity. And God cares about our money because he cares about us. He cares about our survival. He cares about our identity. He cares about all this stuff that it kind of gets linked into. And scripture doesn't talk about money so that preachers can take advantage of poor people, okay? <laughs> you know, it's not about uh, preaching about money so that you can get more money or so you can convince people to give, right? He has a lot to say about the misuse of money by religious people, right? By spiritual leaders. So, so scripture talks about money for our benefit. It talks about money so that we can understand how we should relate to money, how we can have a healthy relationship with money, right? Since money or possessions, they're needed to survive. We're not going to get away from them. We all have to deal with it, and we get to determine what kind of relationship we're going to have with money. Who wants to have a healthy relationship with money? I do. Yeah. We want our relationship with money to be a blessing, right? And not a curse <laughs> because we know it can be one or the other. You know, the foundation for all of our conversations about money is this. Money madness 
is thinking your heavenly father won't take care of you. That's what we covered last week. Money madness is thinking your heavenly father won't take care of you. Listen, if he takes care of the birds and he takes care of the plants, he's going to take care of you. And, and Jesus, he says it so beautifully. You can listen to last week's message if you want to, but listen, he says it so beautifully. Listen, wouldn't I take better care of you than I take care of birds? Are you not a more important than a bird? Say, I'm more important than a bird. <laughs> and, and God's going to take care of me, right? And so we're going to trust in God, right? And so it's surprising how obedient we will be to God when we really believe that he's going to take care of us. And so that lays the framework for everything we're going to talk about. It lays the framework for saying, okay, if God's going to take care of me, I can follow God's instructions about money, right? Right? Amen. Amen. All right. So now God has a lot more to say about money than just trust me and I'll take care of you. There's a lot more that he says than that, okay? He says that, but that's not it. Nothing that we do with money should step outside of that basic principle, but we know that one of the ways that God provides for us and one of the ways that he takes care of us is by giving us instructions about how money works and how we should relate to it. And so we want to follow biblical principles. God provides for us in lots of different ways and we're going to look at the financial wisdom found in Scripture. And so the book of Proverbs is a probably one of the most practical books in the Bible. In fact, when it comes to money, it definitely is. It's one of those books of the Bible where it's like, wow, this is just telling you the way that it is, right? It tells you how to do life right, and uh, it tells you how we should relate to money. So we've heard these narratives from culture about money, right? We've heard that we should uh, buy something because we deserve it, not because we can afford it, right? I deserve it. doesn't matter if I can afford it. Uh, we want what we want now. We want it now. We don't want it later. Uh, and how we need to buy and own and experience in order to be satisfied in life. But what does Scripture say? So I'm going to read a couple of verses from Proverbs, and then we're going to kind of come back to them as we move along here. So there's a couple of verses from Proverbs just to get us started. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 17 says this. Whoever loves pleasure will become poor. Whoever loves wine and olive oil will never be rich. <clears throat> well, that's interesting. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 21, verse 20 says this. The wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 through 8 says this. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. So what can we learn from this uh, spirit-inspired book of ancient wisdom? What does it mean for us today? We're going to pray that God would open it up to us. Lord, we thank you for the practical wisdom that you have in your word. We thank you that you don't leave us to figure out everything on our own, but Lord, you have given us uh, inspired, Holy Spirit inspired instructions and guidance and wisdom. And, and I pray, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, to be wise and to listen to instruction. God, I pray it for every single person here, God, wherever we're at in our financial journey, whether we feel like we are doing just fine or we feel like we're barely hanging on by a thread, I just pray that you would bring hope and you would bring peace and you would bring direction to each person here. And we just pray that it's your Holy Spirit that would do the work. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. So as we read those three verses, those three passages from Proverbs, it's easy to identify the money madness here, okay? And today's money madness is this. Money madness is spending whatever you have whenever you have it. <laughs> money madness is spending whatever you have whenever you have it. <clears throat> now, this is a touchy subject because it's easy to get defensive when it comes to money. How many of you have identified that? <laughs> Maybe you've already felt that. Listen, in a recent survey, 60% uh, of Americans answered yes when asked if they are living paycheck to paycheck. 60% of Americans. 
meaning they spend their entire paycheck before they get to their next paycheck, meaning they don't feel like there's anything extra, okay? They, they're not saving anything. And I didn't realize this. I'd always heard that, like one of those like nightly news statistics things, you know? Um, but it fluctuates a lot. Like it'll be like 80% sometimes, and then it'll go down to like 50% and kind of like, but it, it fluctuates like a lot, like per month. But what the, the basics of it are is that there's, there's certain people that are definitely in difficult situations, right? We, most of us have been in a situation or, or are in a situation where we don't feel like or we don't make very much money. Have you guys experienced that? Maybe, you don't have to raise your hands if you haven't, but you know, I know I have. You're like, wow, this, is, this isn't that much, you know? And so it's like, how, you're trying to figure out how you're gonna make ends meet, how you're gonna pay for everything that you need to pay for, okay? There's certainly people that are in that situation. However, these statistics, when they ask this question, more than 50% of people making over $100,000 a year said they were living paycheck to paycheck, okay? More than 50% of people making $100,000 a year. Now, this is not just an issue that affects people that are on fixed incomes. It's not just an issue that affects people that are uh, having difficulty, you know, the, the working poor, people that are having difficulty finding a good job. Many people say that they are spending whatever comes in, whenever it comes in. <laughs> whatever comes in, they spend it. You know, we're experiencing inflation at the grocery store and lots of other places. Have you guys noticed that? <laughs> okay. But there's another kind of inflation we see at work uh, that helps to keep people living paycheck to paycheck. And it's called lifestyle inflation. Lifestyle inflation. And I'll explain what it is. Have you ever gotten a raise <clears throat> and then two weeks after you got your raise, you don't remember how you made it on what you used to make? <laughs> You're like, I have no idea how I used to survive on what I used to make. A month ago, I mean, like, you're like, because it's all going somewhere. I don't think I'm really wasting it, but it's gone. And so, you know, I think transparency is a good thing. So I'm going to give you an example from my own life. After, after being at my previous church, <laughs> Cassie's like, what's she going to say? You know, <laughs> it's kind of fun having her in here. I like this, you know. <laughs> so after being at my previous church for a couple of years, the church decided it was time to give us a raise, okay? And the raise was going to start on January 1st. And we were looking to forward to hopefully having a little more wiggle room in our budget because, you know, we were like, well, you know, we, you know, we'd like to be able to save. We don't feel like we really can, you know, all that kind of stuff. You guys have been there, right? And so, you know, as I was returning uh, from taking Malachi sledding one afternoon in late December, early January, right around the time of this raise, uh, the temperatures began to drop and it began to snow. And I, the road ahead of me uh, curved, okay? And the family van and I and my son did not curve. We kept going straight, you know. We tried to curve, but it was a little icy. And so we, uh, you know, slid off the road into a grassy median, and we encountered a road sign that uh, helped to slow us down <laughs> <laughs> and also helped to completely tear out the undercarriage of my van, you know. And uh, Malachi and I were fine. Malachi still talks about it in odd tones, you know. <laughs> We almost died. <laughs> but uh, the van, which was an older van, it was totaled. And so uh, we needed another van. We did not have money saved up for a vehicle, right? So we went van shopping, and we actually bought the van that we have now, which I'm very thankful for. The sad thing was that the budget that was tight before the raise was still just as tight because the payment on the van that we had just bought was right about what the raise was. As our income went up, so did our expenses. And you've probably experienced this. You know, maybe it's, it's not as specific as this, but I found I have no problem in my mind responsibly spending anything that I got, any money that comes <laughs> in, right? You know? Amen. And so our lifestyle inflates with our income. And when we, when we make more money, we often spend more money we, because we always want more, right? So, so how does this compare with the verses that we read? Proverbs 21, 17 says, whoever loves pleasure will become poor. Whoever loves wine and olive oil will never be rich. You know, I don't think of myself as materialistic, but I like a vacation as, as much as the next guy, you know? I like to do all the stuff 
Sometimes doing stuff costs money. The same as buying stuff costs money, right? And, and so whether you love pleasure or you love wine and olive oil, which is like expensive drinks and food, you know, whatever it is, listen, experience and possessions will take as much as we give them, right? If, if, we, if, if we say, you know what, they will keep wanting more and more. And the easy way out is to just uh, wait until we don't have any money and then say, well, I can't because I don't have any money. It's, it's pretty hard to say, I have the money, but I'm not going to spend it, <laughs> right? You know, when your kids, you say like, well, dad, do you have the money for this? It's like, yeah, I, I have the money, but I'm not going to spend it, you know? And sometimes we have trouble telling ourselves that when we really want something, I have the money, but I'm not going to spend it. You know, we may not be in real poverty, but it, just like this verse says, when we love pleasure, we become poor. When we love wine and olive oil, we'll never be rich. If you don't learn how to tell yourself no, you'll never start to build wealth, right? We'll never really be financially healthy if we don't know how to say no to ourselves. And the ant is the picture given to us of what financial responsibility looks like. <clears throat> Proverbs 6, 6 through 8 says, Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food in the harvest. <clears throat> and so this word sluggard is not a word that I have ever called someone in as an insult. It's not <laughs> like a normal word that I normally hear. Um, but it, the idea is it's a lazy person, okay? And what I find interesting is it's not just a lazy person who's like doesn't want to work. W really, a, a better understanding of it is it's someone who is not responsible with the resources of their time, which is what laziness is, being irresponsible with the resource of your time, or being irresponsible with the resource of your money, because we all know that those two things are linked. And the wisdom offered here, it gives us hope. It gives us hope because if we say, I'm not very responsible, maybe I am a sluggard. Maybe I'm not responsible with my time or I'm not responsible with my money. And I take the easy way out because it's easy. It's easy and lazy to just say yes instead of say no. Right? You know, maybe you're here and your New Year's resolution was to uh, start saving and stop spending as much. And you've already quickly fallen off the wagon. <laughs> But, you know, the ant has some lessons for us. And the Bible says to be like the ant. Be like the ant. You know, the first lesson we see in the ant is that it has no commander or overseer or ruler. In other words, no one has to make the ant work or save, right? The ant has, uh, but, but there's another element to this. It's not just that the ant has self-control to do stuff on its own. Listen to what Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7 says. <clears throat> the rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. So if we want to be like the ant and not have a taskmaster, not have a master, we want to be out of debt. Because when we borrow money, we give ourselves a, ta a taskmaster. So we used to be able to choose how we spent our money. I was able to choose what I did with my raise until I bought a vehicle and got a loan because at that point, I then don't have a choice about whether I spend that money or not. It's not a flexible area. It's a hard set area. Now I obligated myself and I must pay. And to the extent that we are obligated, we are a slave. So if we're to be like the ant with who, who has no ruler or commander, we must avoid debt. To be like the ant, we must avoid debt. Now, what's great about the Bible, but specifically the book of Proverbs, is it just tells you how it is. It just says, listen, the rich rule over the poor. Do you guys realize that? Like, okay, duh, you know, the rich rule over the poor. And the borrower slave to the lender. It just says, listen, this is just how it is. And you can make up your own mind about what to do about it, Right? Now, there's nothing in the Bible that tells you that being in debt is a sin, okay? It doesn't say it's a sin, 
but it doesn't have anything positive to say about it. <laughs> it's like, it's never like, you know, this is just a great way to live life. You know, obligate yourself so you constantly have to work and then give whatever you make to somebody else, right? It, that's not what we want to do. It's not a great deal. Now, we know that there are some debts that are better than others, okay? So there's a difference between a payday loan and a credit card and a boat loan and a car note and a mortgage, okay? There's a, there's a difference between those things. You know, an affordable mortgage on a house that was a wise purchase uh, is different than uh, my new 75-inch TV on a credit card, right? Those are two different kinds of purchases and two different kinds of debt. But biblically, we want to do everything we can to own what we can free and clear. When we look at what the Bible says a path towards financial health is, that's the path. It's what the ant does. He doesn't have a master. He just does what he's supposed to do. And the next thing we see is to be like the ant, we must learn to spend less money than we make. Or in other words, to save money, because if you spend the same amount of money that you make or more money, you can't save money, right? The ant stores its provisions in summer. Proverbs chapter 21, 20 says, The wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. <clears throat> now, some people have the idea that it's not godly to save money. I've heard of church boards that have the mindset that like, look, we should not save this money. Listen, we have money. We better spend it. It's we better spend it. We better do some ministry with it. We better do something. And that, or even personally, that we should give away or spend everything that we have because if we save money, we might get miserly or we might get rich, and that would be bad, okay? <laughs> However, that is not what Scripture says. <laughs> scripture does not say that we should, we should spend or even give everything that we have away. It says wise people save money. Say it together. Wise people save money right? And so in order to spend less than we make, we have to figure out how to make and develop a plan to spend our money. Does anybody know what that's called? A budget. It's a plan to make and spend our money. We have to figure out how much money's coming in and figure out how we're going to spend it, right? And so um, if you've never done this before, you will often discover things that will surprise you. <clears throat> I remember being 18 years old, and I had a job, and uh, I remember going through my debit card because I have never balanced a checkbook in my life. I've always used a debit card, and it just didn't make any sense, you know? So I just looked at the bank statement online, and they told me what, what I spent. So I, I looked at my bank statement online, and I was like, I wonder how much money I spend on fast food, you know? So at the time, I was probably, I was probably making like $10 an hour or something like that, uh, you know? So and I added up how much money I spent on food in a month. And it was like $400 at like Taco Bell and Wendy's. <laughs> and like, I mean, I was like out every day. I mean, I didn't really cook any food. I just <laughs> ate fast food, you know? Like, and so I remember adding it up and being like, wow, I am spending a lot of money on this. You know, this is just me. I wasn't taking my kids out. And this was also like 15 years ago. <laughs> you know, I was like, wow. And so when we do a budget if we've never done it before we discover things we might not be paying attention to okay sometimes you'll discover ways that you can save money and you don't even realize it however sometimes and oftentimes the case is once you take a good hard look at your finances we realize we've been ignoring them because we don't want to face them <laughs> we've been ignoring them because we have to make choices about how we're going to spend our money and those choices will require us to say no to some things. They will require us to, to actually set aside money to save. You know, it's hard. We all want to enjoy life. We want to do things that are fun. Um, we want to feel like we have some money. We may have some pride in what we're able to do. But if we're going into debt to do it, or we're spending everything we make, and not storing anything away, the Bible says to be wise, we need to make an adjustment. To be wise, we need to make an adjustment. 
That's just what God says, okay? <laughs> this, you know, this is for me too, you know? To be wise, we need to make an adjustment. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8 says this. Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. Godliness with contentment is great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. Contentment is the key to spending less money than you make. Contentment is the key. You know, godliness pairs well with contentment. When we put God first, like we talked about last week, we don't have to stress about our survival, right? Because we know that God is going to take care of us. And we also know that our lives are not measured by what we have or what we own or what we can do, right? And so we know that eternal things are so much more important than material things. We're actually wealthy when we have godliness. And so this contentment comes along and it says, listen, God is good and life is good. And I don't have to buy anything. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to go anywhere to experience the goodness of God in my life. I don't have to do anything. I don't lack anything. That's what contentment is. You know, we all know that we need to make some money to buy food and clothes and things like that. But in order to spend less than we have, we've got to be content. But the ant does something else. It's not just content. It doesn't just save money and not, not eat everything right away. But to be like the ant, we need to work diligently. The ant stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at the harvest. And what's interesting is that ants are not stressed about the work that they do. They just do it, right? You ever see an ant that's like stressed out? Maybe they are. I don't know. But they don't look, they just look like they're just busy working. That's just what they're always going to do. You know, work is a good thing. Did you know that? Work is a good thing. You know, before sin came into the world, before Adam and Eve sinned, God gave Adam and Eve the work of cultivating the garden. You know, God is a creator, and he made us in his image, and so he created us to be creators. He created us to be maintainers and to be people that make things better than they were when we came. We, we, we were created to serve people. All the things that we do that are work, those are things that we were created to do before the fall. These are not sinful things. These are good things. Our work is valuable, but it's also the way that God has created for us to provide for ourselves. It's common sense. If I'm out in the wilderness and I want to eat, what must I do? I must hunt an animal. I must, I must, you know, kill something and drag it back to the cave and eat it, <laughs> you know? Like, I, I must climb a tree and get some apples. I must do some things. It is natural that we are designed to care for ourselves and to care for those around us through the means of work. We do our work to honor God and to take care of ourselves and our families. We work diligently, but we also trust God. Because, listen to what Psalms 127, 1 and 2 says. Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with centuries will do no good. It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to his loved ones. Let that sink in. Our work should not be anxiously based on our survival. It, it should not be this like, I've just got to because if I don't, I'm not going to survive. It should be a partnership with God in providing for ourselves and serving the world. A partnership with God in providing for ourselves and for serving the world. Because we know that work is, is the way that we are supposed to take responsibility for ourselves. We work knowing that God is going to care for us. And when we trust that God's going to care for us, it allows us to have rest. 
It allows us to know, you know what? I did my best. I'm working hard and I'm trusting that God is going to provide what I need when I follow his instructions. You know, we work diligently, but we follow God's ways and he honors our efforts. You know, God gave us a model, right? He said, be like the ant, <laughs> be like the ant, avoid debt, spend less money than you make and work diligently. This is the way of wisdom. This is God's way to handle money. And we know that God wants what's best for us and what's best for our money. God is not out there trying to make life harder for us. He's trying to make it easier. He's trying to help us. Now, why do we want to follow this way of wisdom? If we say, you know what, I know it's wise to act this way, but, but what, is, what does wisdom get for me? Maybe it's, maybe it's wiser to just enjoy what I have and just spend everything I have and not pay attention to this wisdom. Proverbs 3.17 says this, Wisdom's ways are pleasant ways, and all its paths lead to peace. Wisdom's ways are pleasant ways, and all its paths lead to peace. You see, wisdom leads to peace. When, when, we, when we operate in wisdom, we don't have to be stressed out because God wants us to have peace in our finances. We can learn to grow in this. Listen, none of us are where we want to be in most areas of our lives. Most of us say, you know what? I've got some room to improve. I could learn to use to say no a few more times. I could learn to, to save more. I could, I, could learn to, to, um, I could learn to be more diligent in this area. But you know what God wants us to do? He wants us to submit to his lordship and his wisdom and say, you know what? God's way is the right way. And so when I think about how I'm going to how I'm going to manage my finances, I'm going to follow God's way and I know that when I do that, he is going to give me peace. He's going to provide for me and he's going to give me peace. So, let's take a moment and pray. Lord, we thank you for your wisdom. <clears throat> it's amazing that, you know, in in books of the Bible that are 3000 years old, you know, we have this wisdom that so closely relates to our world today. And God, I pray that you would help us to listen to your word when we, when we are looking for the way that we should live our lives. I pray you'd confront the things in our minds and in our hearts that, that cause us uh, to be discontented. I pray that you would help each person here and each person that listens to this message online. I pray that you would, you would teach us to be content and teach us to be godly, that we would be godly and content, and that we would experience and know that we have great wealth just in that. God, I pray that this would be a church that would be wise with its finances. And God, I pray that as we're wise with our finances, Lord, that you would bring blessing into our lives. God, we love you, and we trust you. You know, while everybody's eyes are closed and everybody's heads bowed, I want to give you the opportunity uh, to think about your relationship with the Lord. You know, we read a verse, and this is what it said. It said, unless the Lord builds the house, you labor in vain. Unless the Lord builds the house, you labor in vain. You know, maybe you have been trying to build a house in your life. You've been trying to build a life but it feels like it's going nowhere. God wants to give you rest. He wants you to be able to trust him. And so if you've been building your house, you've been building your life, but you have not been building with God, if you have been uh, away from him and you have not submitted and given your life to him, I want to invite you to give your life to Jesus today. You have an opportunity today to give your life to Christ. That means that you say, you know what? I've been going one way, and I know that that's the wrong way. And I know that, that I'm a sinner. I know that I mess up, and I don't serve God the way that I'm supposed to. And I want to repent for that sin. I want Jesus to forgive me, wash away my sins, and give me a brand new life. So if you're here this morning and you want to do that for the first time, I just want you to raise your hand, and I want to be able to pray for you this morning. If there's anybody here this morning, this is your opportunity. And for the rest of us that are here this morning, I just want to pray a prayer of blessing 
over each and every one of you. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor in every area of your life, and may he give you his peace. Amen.